Hello, everybody, and welcome to the premiere episode of Between Two Kataras. I'm Jonathan, and I'm with Eric and Tarek. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. And today, we're actually going to be talking about something that if we go back to May 2020, that Eric and Tarek had actually been talking about already. So that is the, the joining between creativity and technique. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys to have a little chit chat about what it was that you were talking about. And I'll probably just interject every once in a while. Yeah. You want to start or should I? Uh, Go for it. Well, we talked about doing a podcast about this, but this was before we actually had an established podcast. So we had a couple of notes we wanted to hit. We were spitballing, but to be frank, it was a little bit awkward because again, it was just trying to find that natural tone of what the conversation should sound like. But the general idea, and we really wanted to talk about it a bit more thoroughly today, was the fact that creativity and being really heavily focused on technique, a lot of people tend to have those two ideas as mutually exclusive things, when quite frankly, they're actually very closely intertwined. It's kind of like the idea of having amazing ideas, but not having the ability to do them, or having a ton of skills, but not the creativity with which to put them into. So yeah, we kind of wanted to break that one down. Is that generally good? So you pretty much hit the nail on the head on that one, and honestly, 2020, May 2020, like we were just trying to figure out what, what exactly is even a podcast. So like really to like, it was our first go of trying to put it together. We were actually just trying to figure out whether we were going to have a company or not. Oh, that's <laughs> also true. Yeah, that's very also much true. so. Like I mean, that was yeah. two years ago and like, yeah. I think we've evolved dramatically. Um, we yeah. started to understand what we what want to do and we're refining things. But yeah, that's exactly what the topic would talk about. Um, well, and I think we've come of technologically we've come so much further. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's something that's huge for us to be able to actually set this up. And for those people who are really interested, we're going to have a spot the microphone game. <laughs> and we'll go, we'll go from there. That's a great game. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd be worried for those who can't find the microphone. <laughs> But, but no, I, and you and I were talking just before we, we started filming, Eric was, and the word that I was looking for that I couldn't think about right then was the spectrum mm -hmm. of, you know, having techniques on one side of the spectrum and creativity on the other and everything that everybody works towards to move along that spectrum. And so much of what we do as instructors is we tend to focus a lot on technique mm -hmm. and almost to the point where we stifle creativity at that point. And that's a mistake that I would say that we make. You know, you want to always encourage that creativity, um, but keep people grounded on, on the technique. Oh, 100%. I think it's really important to, to help yourself sidestep that problem by explaining the context behind why a certain technique is important mm -hmm. and also what the future uses of them could be. Yeah. Because ultimately, if you learn a specific technique, let's just say lead and frost, how to sear something well, mm -hmm. if you can show people what the results are, you can tell them what the creative aspects of it are. Yeah. It's kind of like having a ballpoint hammer versus a regular 12 inch. It's like knowing mm -hmm. exactly what each tool can do. So you can say, oh, I need that to do this. Yeah. But that's something that can really help you understand like what tools are in your toolbox and help us help students understand that too. Yeah. It's like learning a language, quite frankly. Yeah, exactly. Is hundred percent learning a language, and it's it's uh, yeah. We're you're right. We try to you know focus so much on technique, um, sometimes to a detriment. But it's because we understand the building blocks that mm -hmm. needs to be that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, we're not looking to push someone to do a triathlon before yeah. they even know how to run. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, and so that's why we're like going back to this like we just want we want to just like focus on this yeah. core fundamental to free you to do so much more yeah yeah well and i think what you said the triathlon thing is really important because it's all about goals mm -hmm. and there's a difference between goals and then skipping over the practice to get to the end game mm -hmm. having a goal that you can work towards is fantastic mm -hmm. and if you are a creative person what we don't want is for you to get frustrated because your hands don't work the way you want them to oh, yeah. or your you know your talent doesn't work the way you want it to so i think it's all about incremental growth 
one hundred percent. Like it's one of those things, and that's definitely one of my catchphrases. Always one hundred percent. I'm ninety seven percent. You like that three percent margin of error. <laughs> but it's one of those things where the practice is so important, and yeah. that's where a lot of people tend to drop off because everybody, especially in the age we live in, we get bombarded with perfection yeah. in every way, shape, and form. And when it comes to food, it's just we see the finest dishes, the nicest plates. Everything looks pristine. So yeah. everybody sees this all the time and they think, I can do that. Yeah. And it's not to say that people aren't capable, but they don't realize that the concept of 10,000 hours, yeah. that idea that people have to get the reps in, like they forget that for someone to make a pristine line on a plate or to get a puree, the perfect texture, or to get the color on a soup or a stock or something, exactly what you're looking for, there are tons of recipes and tons of times they've done it before that weren't right. Yeah. When you have people obsessed with perfect results every time, once they see the first or second or third time not turn out, they'll say, oh, it's not for me. Yeah. But getting over that hump of having to constantly adjust and improve, that's where you get people who can develop those skills and become specialists and become skilled. Yeah, I, completely, completely. What would you say to someone who, who has gone through that three or four times of trial and now are getting frustrated? Like what, what, would, what would your or word of encouragement to continue like, you know, that growth of practicing and stick yeah. with it. Don't give up. What would you tell someone? Well, I think the biggest thing is to actually go through with them and figure out what went well. I mean, it could be the entire practice didn't work, mm -hmm. but maybe there was a portion of it that did work well. Maybe your knife cuts were great, but when you seared it, eh, it didn't work as well, right? Focus on building up. And this is where I think we do this in person. And sometimes it's harder when we work with people online to give them those levels of encouragement. And But it's all about just, and again, it just comes down to incremental growth. What went well? What didn't go well? Focus on what didn't go well. Move on from there. Uh, there's always going to be things that work well. doesn't matter how, you know, how often you try it. Yeah. It sounds like a very glib way to put it, but... It's about technical troubleshooting. Sure. And like I said this yesterday while we were teaching the sushi class, it's like that technique to become like a tr like traditional sushi a master. Yeah. You have to be someone who has done the basic of the basic thousands and thousands of times until yeah. you have it like the back of your hand, you understand it so well. Yeah. But for everybody last night, it's their first time. A lot of them haven't made sushi before. And I always tell people just to keep them on that path of encouragement. Yeah. Even for me, the first time I've had to make any recipe, it doesn't always turn out the way I want it to. But instead of getting upset, I understand like, oh, this is good, that I would change, this I'll improve, and I do it again. So yeah. the first time is never gonna be perfect. No right. one is capable of serving up magic every time they do something, unless they are extremely gifted or talented, yeah. or they're a really good liar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about being able to get back on the horse, examine what went wrong, and then go for another ride. Exactly. Simple. What about you, Eric? Well, I, you guys hit the nail on the head, but I think the one thing is, 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 is journaling and chrono, you know, doing some way of to like showing the progress you've made. Yeah. It's so easy to just look at it as a failure, but yeah. to actually analyze what yeah. was successful and what didn't work, yeah. that's the part that people almost skip over. Yeah. And if you skip over that part, you're really not developing that toolbox that you want. No. Mm -hmm. right? And it's all, I think food is the inhibitor here. So many people do other hobbies in their life mm -hmm. and failure in those hobbies is totally fine. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when it, when it comes to food, you feel like you're wasting it if something doesn't go the way you want. Oh, yeah. And honestly, I've eaten many failures, and they still sure. taste great. They just don't look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and that's totally fine. But you yeah. Think about, yeah, you think about those sushi people last night. Yes, they didn't make food sushi that looked like a sushi master had made it. All tasted great. They were stoked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Dang it. Three times. <laughs> <laughs> 97%. Uh, <laughs> the count's going up. But yeah, 100%. Yeah. Four. They, <laughs> they were all so stoked that yes. like they had never made it before, but they did it from scratch, start to finish. And yeah. even though they weren't pretty, a lot of them had nicely arranged plates. The colors were right. The shapes were generally right. Yeah. And it's just something where, like you said, Eric, when people skip over that part where they say, oh, no, it's just not good enough. Yeah. It's people who are obsessed with perfection in yeah. that way where honestly it's actually really hard people are hard on themselves yeah. they think that it has to turn out right every time i'm like no 
It might not look the best, it's still gonna taste all right, and then you can try again. Absolutely. <laughs> How can you tell we're Main Street? Everyone? Main Street, yes. Main Street, Welcome to Main Street. Um, <laughs> but I think too, and we talk about this a lot, is the whole idea of traps that people fall into, right? And one of the traps is the curse of the adult learner, right? Exactly. You know, and it's just like, I need to compare myself to other people. I, I, I can't, if I don't succeed, it's because somebody else is better than me. It's not because I did my best and it's better than it was the last time. So, yeah. whoa, there's something big happening. Oh, uh, no, that was only two two cards. You need three no, for, for you to say that. Oh, there's three. Yes. But that's something major. It yeah, is something, something big. Okay, wow. you can say it. Say it. Heck, something big's happening. Ah, uh, jeez. 100%. 100%. Damn. <laughs> Five. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's yeah. entirely true. But that honestly, that that pitfall applies to young and old. It oh, sure. Out of the age, people tend to look at the people next to them and be like, "Why did they get it better? Or they're better yeah. than me? I got to keep up." But everyone's progress is their own. And I always kind of equate it to. I'll think about when I was learning sourdough. I had zero zero skill behind that. I yeah. never knew how to do it. I turned up 11 bricks yeah. and eventually after learning how to adjust, tweak, get it right, may have kicked one bread out my patio door. Yeah. Totally never had. No, it, it didn't happen. It happened. It happened. Actually, happened. knowing you, that happened. <laughs> it 100% happened. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but after that, I adjusted and I learned, but it was just the fact that I would ask people around me instead of saying like, oh, Warren's bread's better than mine or Eric's bread's better than mine. I was starting to ask people what are you doing that works well? What patterns can I see? What am I doing incorrectly yeah. that I can adjust? Because ultimately, my progress is my own. Yeah. And if there are people who know better, there's nothing wrong with saying they are better than me. I can ask them and see what else I can glean off that. Yeah. And stubbornness is not a bad thing. You know? And I think... And, and uh, Yeah. But I think, though, that we should... we when it comes to certain things, it's okay to be stubborn. It's okay to say, this bread is not going to beat me. Mm. Right? Yeah. With, I mean, it's, with food, it's hard. It's so difficult not to make that immediate comparison because there's immediate results. Yes. Right? Like side by side to you. Would you say the food industry in general, like in terms of like the media that we see out there is doing people a bit of a disservice oh, by yeah. not showing them the failures at times. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. If you, and actually I was, I was on a panel and we talked about this exact thing. When you watch the food network, mm -hmm. everything is beautifully mise en place. Everything is done by somebody else. Literally this person is perfectly set up mm -hmm. to succeed. Yeah. Right, and you you think about the insecurities that that person has, that they are incapable of the thought of failure. Mm -hmm. Right, well, you think about the images that people are shown as well. It's usually either that of absolute perfection, a wizard in his laboratory. Yeah. Are wizards in laboratories or lairs? What are they? Where do they? Make uh, their they, 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 sure, I in a lair. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. a wizard in his lair casting spells. <laughs> But they, they, but they only show the absolute like technical yes. masterminds at their finest yes. or they show high pressure, short time people like ah, running yes. around the kitchen, yes. making a mess, making noise, accidentally cutting themselves, burning things because that's good TV. Yes. But it gives people this misconception of what cooking should actually be like. That's why for me, when I think about yeah. one of my favorite cooking shows growing up, yeah. funny enough, Barefoot Contessa. Yeah. Mm. It's such a mellow, relaxed setting and she walks through everything with this like light air about her. Yeah. Um, and is not afraid to make mistakes. And she's not afraid to make mistakes. If anything, it actually makes it much more entertaining 100%. because she just owns it and it's fun. But like helping yeah. people understand that good cooking doesn't have to be exclusive to the extremes. It's yeah. actually for everybody. And it just comes down to finding your roots. Like, that's the thing. Your kitchen should be your fun place. Yeah. It shouldn't be like, oh, what am I going to make today? And, run and around. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. It's not about cooking for other people. It's about learning and growing for yourself. Other people benefit from that. But, it's, but it's, it is about personal growth. I mean, we talk about failure. I mean, Farron Adria... Uh, you know, the, the master behind El Bulli restaurant talks about how he failed far more times, hundreds more times than he ever succeeded. 
And, you know, it, it's always about how do I get and learn and grow from there? And it, there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, no one out there is going to show off their failures. That's the thing. No. No one is. But those people who have that, uh, what was the word that would describe that perseverance? Yes. That yeah. stubbornness. Yes. Grit, those are the people that are going to push through to make sure that their creative idea yeah. is going to come fruition at one point because they're going to learn the techniques to yeah. get them there. Well, when we stand in front of students yeah. and something doesn't go right, mm -hmm. we have no choice but to own it. I, at this point, I th I've, I've begun to learn it makes us more real. A hundred percent. And? hundred <laughs> percent. Six. Six. <laughs> and it makes it... A <laughs> it makes everything more approachable. Yeah. Because if we're a lot able to laugh about it, yeah, it makes the learner more relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. And if you can especially go to that, go through those steps of identifying what went wrong, how you would rectify it, all these different things. I mean, it's so much more meaningful to those students. Well, they can identify with that a lot better because ultimately, yeah. like for me, one of the things I enjoy the most about what we do is even though, yes, we are teaching people, I also get to learn yeah. and I'm learning stuff all the time. And even though I've only been here for two and a half years, I've had to do a lot of- You're our COVID baby. I am. <laughs> 100%. Seven. <laughs> but like- for me, I've had to do so many dishes, so many recipes that I frankly have never seen before. Right. Like I graduated here in 2011 yeah. and the concept of all the cooking that we did and the curriculum was vastly different. Yeah. And what we do now, like I've had to be in front of a group of 32 people making something I've never seen before. And I don't have a concept of what it is. So I'll take the time to make it at home a couple days yeah. ahead or I'll redo the recipes and try to envision what it's supposed to be like. But when I do make mistakes, totally lean into it because they have to know that like, just because I've been cooking for X amount of years doesn't mean I'm any better than someone who's brand new. I am actually more humbled to learn in front of people yeah. because then you can know that we are able to connect on that level. I'm gonna, this is really good because this will connect back and we're gonna probably call it after this, but you are confident enough in your techniques to be able to draw on those strengths to do something that you've never done before because you can see similarities. You can see these things that are going to, um, you know what the results are going to be even though you've never made that dish. And I think that's a really, you know, that's, that's a, a great way to end this. Anything that you guys want to say before we call it? I don't want to bring the count up to eight because we've already said it a lot. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. Oh, okay. You can say 97%. Uh, no, I'm not, no, no. I think this is a great premiere episode and I uh, hope to put more, put more out there. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks everybody for watching the premiere episode of uh, Between Two Kataras. Uh, I'm Jonathan with Eric and Tarek. We'll see you next time. Wait, should we explain to them what a guitar is? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's what Google is for. Cool. Okay. You guys do it again, I'm trying to get the point. <laughs> <laughs>